So that was a little English test here <laughs> this morning. I, I looked at it now and, and I said to myself, there is something wrong in that title. So I, I even had to ask my friends there. Uh, my name is Lina Axelsson Kildon and I work in Haninge in municipality. And I am responsible for the compulsory schools here in, in this area. And uh, we have about 9,000 students. Uh, I'm very impressed by this day, and, uh, but I can't take any credit for, for organizing it. So it's all due to Eva Hattel and, and the other in her crew working on it. I think I've been a burden more, <laughs> but here I am. And uh, otherwise, I, I sometimes wear different hats. And I'm part of the school commission. So for, for you who want to know what the end result will be this spring when we present our final paper, you, you are in the wrong place because I want that hat I won't wear at all today. Uh, I will more uh, uh, talk about management of schools and also cultures within schools and, and what we can do to actually improve because we, we live in a, in an, in an era where we try for, to go from something to something and we don't really know what. And that's <laughs> all, uh, it's, it's part of the system. So we go through a few things and, uh, and I'm very glad to, to give the broken English a face. So <laughs> be with me on that one. So uh, the school as an organization, for who is it made? Yeah, that's a good question. We all presume it is for, for the students, but we'll see. Uh, I, I sometimes say that we have today a uh, what can we do school? Because we, uh, when we try to improve quality, we learn from the results. And that's quite normal. You, you wait until you get the results and then you start improving. And, uh, and, and, and that's quite normal, we, we, we presume. And we do that systematically at least once a year. You know, every year in, in June, I stand in front of the politicians and I present what we have achieved over the year. And we tend to plan once a year because the system, the organization needs a, a clear plan what to do because everyone needs to be secure. If you're a teacher, sometimes it's very, it's good for your vacation to know how your schedule looks in the, looks in the autumn. So, and when new things come along, we ask, what can we do? And suddenly it's so good to have the schedules, we can go back. Who has got an extra hour for that challenge we stand in front of? You know, that's what we do. And uh, <laughs> we have a system where we tell everyone what the goal is. And at the same time, we tell people how often they should do it, in what, what frequency, and so on. So it's in, in one way, we, we give quite a lot of instructions, even though we say, you do whatever you want to, to get to the goal. And, and that's quite complicated. It's a goal setting and a result driven management, uh, but with a strict timetable. Because you know the fear in the system for doing something wrong, when you don't give enough hours of math or something else or give too much, are we wasting the money then, or what? So what is the result of, of this thing that we take for granted It is quite normal? We take the first one here, we get the checklist management. And this is taken from what we call on, on the, the Bruk. It's, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's like a checklist. So every principal can check so they do everything the way they should do. So, and, and if you're a principal in, in, a, in a school, you have 353 things that you have to check every year. And if you have some uh, 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 things, what we call in Sweden, three kids hem, like it's after the school hours, then you have 250 things more to check every year. And we, there is a huge fear of not having checked the list. So sometimes we become very, you know, we have a checklist management. So some people do everything right, 
but they don't achieve the results. So, 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 so what is that? That's a very complicated way, and it's a very stressful way because also when we use the checklist as a management tool, some things happen, and then we say, oh, let's add something to this list. <laughs> you know, I, I sometimes take the example of. You know, if, if a child falls out of a window on the second floor and it becomes written in the newspaper, we say, hey, every school should have a plan how to secure windows. <laughs> and I think that could be good because we, we, could, we don't want fall to, kids to fall out of the windows. At the same time, how much time should that plan take? You know, and will it be something we do without adding anything to the, to the, to the main uh, reasons why we organize the school. The next thing, next thing we, we, uh, we, what creates in, in a, this checklist management culture is that certain things are, no one is really taking responsibility of it. If I look at the legislation today and I, I ask with it, who is responsible for group dynamics? Because most people would say, if you were entering into a classroom, like this is for, from a few years back when I looked at one school. It, it's you know the school. It is not. It's just a bad coincidence. Sorry, uh, <laughs> but it's one third of the students do not enter into high school, higher education in ninth grade. So you enter there with one teacher, one class, and it's one third doesn't. And that teacher should have the same level and be able to reach out to all the students when one third has special needs that need to be addressed. But other schools have 5.8. That means there is one student in the classroom. But no one is really, really looking at this and say, hey, this is my task to try to make this one more even. So every teacher would actually reach their goals uh, and be successful in their, their education. The next thing there is what I call uh, reparative capacity. And, and that's like everything we do, if we have a, uh, uh, like if you pr produce cars, that's a very bad comparison. But if you notice that one third of the cars, or 20%, or otherwise would, the steering wheel would drop off. You say, hey, we need to, to, to address this, you know. So, but here <coughs> or ninth graders, and we started to look at all of them, let's take maths here, who is the, the, the example where we have the bigger challenge, there were 71 children who actually didn't have, uh, they didn't know enough maths to, to pass. Three years later, oh, that's why we started the se seventh grade, up to ninth grade, and we measured the same students three years later and we noticed that 38 of them still didn't pass. So we know things, we discover them, but our capacity to repair it lacks in, in, the, in the knowledge is very poor. And that's a challenge for us. And we could say that this is a very, oh, it's a problematic group of students, but hey, we need to adjust to the students we have. So that's, I'll come back to that a little bit later. And these are teenagers. So I said to myself, oh, it's probably due to the fact that they're teenagers, hormones. So I looked at between the age of 10 to 13, when this the, the end third grade to sixth grade. And, and we actually see that in maths, there were 121 students that, that in, in third year, uh, didn't pass the national exams. And after three years, 50 of them still didn't pass. So our capacity to repair when something is lacking is very uh, low. But I'm very glad we do the, the, the things right, you know, with the checklist. So it becomes <laughs> almost ironical uh, that we could do everything right, but still we, didn't, we don't manage this. And we can't say that the really, they are, they are impossible, because they aren't. So, and uh, another thing are new, newly arrived pupils or students. When we looked at this year, we, we looked at all the students leaving the compulsory school, and we discovered that if a student arrives in, in their first three years, almost every one of them actually got into to higher education <coughs> or uh, 
upper uh, primary, what do you call it? Upper, upper secondary. Upper secondary school, thank you very much. Uh, and we noticed that if you have between the years of fourth grade to sixth grade, 50%. And if you arrive in seventh to ninth grade, but only 15%. And we looked at the same figures the year after. Every one of the ones of the lower up here that is this decreasing uh, uh, a lot. And we can't say that they haven't got any education, they don't have any uh, life experience that could be used. It's actually just our capacity to use it and, and put it into to, uh, action that is very, very low. And we can say that this is uh, impossible but the organization with that planning and so on doesn't always end up. And so trends that I see today that our to-do goals are mixed with target goals. We say that we are very ambitious because next year we're putting a plan in, in together, you know, and that's very ambitious. But I never hear, you know, in the industry, there is so, it's very typical that the, the leader says next year we will have increased our results with 10%. And everyone, oh, that's that's very good leader. In Sweden, we don't often hear uh, people in, in, the, in the leadership of schools saying, hey, next year I want to be here. Next year I want to be there. In five years' time, where are we then? In, in proper numbers. We more tend to talk about what we're going to do than actual targets. And if we do things without reaching any higher targets, are we doing the right thing then? And another thing is that we measure results when it's too late to repair. It's when we try to analyze the, the results, we look at it in June, and all the students have actually left school already. So if we measure when it's too late to repair, are, 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 is it fulfilling any purposes? And, and that's quite funny, because when I meet teachers, especially teachers who have worked a few years, they can go in, they can see the classroom, they know the, teach, the, the students who actually will uh, achieve or reach the goals, and they know who won't. And that they know in September, the year before. So imagine, the teachers are holding on to information, but actually a lot of leaders, like me, even when I worked as a principal, I discovered that with my own stress of wanting to, to increase results, I actually got very curious. So I started to ask them in September, and I was shocked to hear, oh, do you stand in the classroom with one third of your class won't pass? And we know it's in September. What can we do together? It becomes much more interesting. Uh, and sometimes when we put the schedule together, we, we, we tend to use more old challenges and traditions. I say some students, we know that their memory needs perhaps daily maths or English, because some students, they don't, if it is a Wednesday, they don't remember what they did on Monday, and especially if you don't do your homework, you, you actually, you, you are losing in the system. But still, we tend to plan as we did 20, 30, 40 years ago, when the school was much more oriented towards doing the same thing, the students would learn the same things. But nowadays we say, hey, we want the same, but you can do, go different ways to go there. So, so this is something, a huge challenge. And some schools are really trying to, to create the system. So in this system, predictability becomes more important than end results. Uh, and perhaps that's a very strong statement, but, but when I meet uh, uh, how do you explain this without insulting anybody? <laughs> no, no, if you, if you, I, if I meet my teachers every day as a principal, and the relation to, <coughs> re relationship between us is very important. <coughs> then to be the one who actually is going to change the schedule for a group of people on a weekly basis, or perhaps say that every six weeks we will evaluate and we do new things and we try to measure you won't become that popular unless the whole organization actually prepared for it. So the new normal would be actually that, hey, in, at my work, we actually, every three weeks, we look, what can we improve and change the system? But we are not there yet. 
and perhaps we need to become that. So predictability for a good leader in, in schools perhaps is to be quite safe. This schedule will last for the whole year. And everyone said, that's good, because then I can plan my po pony riding <laughs> on Thursdays at three o'clock. So, because we all need to, to, to know what's ahead of us. No one wants to know with, with, with surprises, and that's quite normal. Uh, unless we say it's, it's the new normal is to have a new schedule once in a while due to what the children need. Another thing is the unclear chain of responsibility and decision making. And this is quite, as a principle, I have ideas and opinions about everything. And now when I'm, I, I meet principals one day every second weeks and we have huge discussion about the system and everything. And I try to, to bring it back to say, hey, let's talk about school management, how to organize the school. But they really want to talk about the big issues. And then I meet politicians in different areas, in school commission and so on. And they sometimes want to say, hey, isn't the math teacher better when he stands here than here? <laughs> they are down to classroom issues, and that's the problem, because this lack of, of knowledge about who is taking decision about what things is quite difficult to, to, to address, because everyone is talking about what other people should do. That's a, a lack. Um, and lack of changed knowledge creates stress. So an organization who hasn't changed a lot have huge problems to change. It's like you know, going to therapy in one sense, working on your, on, on your phobias. But when you have a phobia, actually, it's, it's very scary. Even the, the drawn picture of the spider would, would kill you, you know. Uh, but after a while, when you get used to it, it takes away the stress. So it's a knowledge to be able to, to work in, in a flexible environment. So time, time, sometimes, to summarize the trends, is that the problem with students with no grades is not that they can't, cannot succeed. They create a feeling of paralyzing stress and inadequacy of the organization. So sometimes when we talk about the huge catastrophe of newly arrived students, they would be, oh, this is the, the biggest challenge in history. And I said to myself, these 60,000 of the newly arrived students in 6,000 schools means 10 students in every school, statistically. And is that such a big stress? Or is it that we don't know what to do with them? So, so that, that's what, what is actually a catastrophe and, and what is not. And these things we need to talk about. So now I've been complaining and throwing a few rocks in a, you know, in a system where I'm standing in the middle you know, and trying to do something about it. So uh, let's move on. So with, oh, let's do that there. Then I said to myself, what would be better questions to ask? So what would be required school? Because if we meet the challenge and we say, hey, we want to succeed with this group of students, what would be required is a much more interesting question and it's quite scary if it means that we need to to change everything we know as normal if that is required oh are we prepared to do it yes perhaps if you want to and we really say so there that clarify the objective of the school and sometimes i wonder if we in our daily lives i think it's great to every 27th of the month to get my salary and that's quite normal. And, and perhaps I, I believe myself in the system, so my being is the most important. But sometimes I need to go back and say, hey, students getting into the next stage in their education perhaps is the most, most important thing because it's about living or, or dying, actually, for a few students. And, and when we have met them in some areas, I worked in, in an area called Roma, where actually it was, oh, you actually met students who, who were... Yeah, they didn't have much uh, future if they didn't stay in the system, so to say. And another thing that I think is very important is to start using forecasts. <laughs> the knowledge is in the organization, but we don't use it to actually manage. 
But once again, if you, if, I, I sometimes use the example of if you have a UFO with extraterrestrial, you know, people coming, you know, and would say to us here in Harmony Commune, the municipality, that we will take all the nine graders who doesn't a, enter into next step in the educational chain with us, and you will never see them again. <laughs> oh, we will all run to the, you know, to the politicians, and, and everyone in that chain of steering, principals and parents will say, hey, what will we do? Now, let's prior prioritize. Let's do what it is required. And I'm sure some things off the list will drop off, to be honest with you. And I think we will talk much more, and we will be so eager. Even in September, we would say, hey, with these students, pass or will it not? If it won't, let's do something. We panic, you know, we will be much more on the go. But we have forgotten that a little bit. So no panic, but perhaps a little bit more action in the leadership in, in that sense. And, and that would make us organize from the task. Uh, and also in that event, I think we will own our mission much more properly. So. And I, all these translations are made from Google Translate. So <laughs> if you say that, is that English or is it Italian? Yeah, it was a little bit. Uh, yeah, only mission. That sounds good. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so these are the tools. And, and now let's get, get more practical. And uh, uh, so, but this is a tricky question. What would you advise? So. Uh, Quality of teaching is, is always working. That's, I think, we need to have as a proper base. But then when we say, this is not an eyesight test. It is not. <laughs> and so I will explain what this is. It's actually, uh, if, if we start grouping students, I, I don't mean to, that we have to tell them that they are in different groups, but when we are going to manage the school, on, on my level, politicians, and also as principals, or even teachers having something to talk about, I said, if we start saying that in every class or every year in the school, we ask how many specially gifted kids are there. Do, do we have a, do we know? And, well, because, and how many are high achieving students? And who are the ones, how many are there in, in the schools who are just passing, you know, and then they do other things, you know? And who is not, you know, getting there? Who, who are we saying that, oh, they, they need much more? And who is really a challenge, you know? Who has many, many steps forward where we need to prioritize much more, you know? If, if we ask that, so we get the picture because the picture looks very different in different classes in different schools. We can actually start looking at this as a, as a saying that, that all that student here who's got very far of, of getting, you know, passing in, in that in the subject, needs to go there, or at least go there. And every student here should jump up one step. We need to organize that. Because if you just look at this group, these students here will be bored. You know? So we really need to, to say, when I organize my school, when I organize my teaching, we need to have a good grip of these numbers, and we need to see the progress of them. So what I say, quality of teaching is everywhere. And that there is no other profession in, in the world that know this so good as teachers. I have to say that even though I, I, I'm a principal, you know, I'm a principal. So because many people want to step in there, asking should the teacher stand here or oh, that should stand here, but teachers know that and they need to own it, and we, we have to be clear with that. But uh, I, a lot of students are wobbling between. Getting there, not getting there, they perhaps are sick three weeks and, and they are sad. And, and the students who are in the process of learning what the rest of the class is learning perhaps need to have supportive measures. I call it supporting measures because sometimes in the school system we say, are we using that paper for extra anpassningar, you know, or are we using the one for what just program? So sometimes what we call a thing is more important than actually what we want to achieve. So if I say to someone, we need to support in measures for this group of students, I actually mean that we need to give them a push so they stay in the system. So what we call that, is that exam passing and what yet program? I don't care, I want to know what the purpose is, because that's important. 
Well, we come to the next one. We have a huge group that is so statistically, but actually are bringing their bag with them. You know, it's quite heavy burden to be a teenager and every year, every six months, you get your paper saying with an F failure, you know. And it's very tricky to say to students that it doesn't have anything to do with your personality or who you are. It's just a grade. No, they take it quite seriously. They do. So, so we call that. And then a teacher and the school needs to be able to organize reparative measures. And if you need to repair, for example, some teachers come to me and say, this student in eighth grade are on a five uh, grade level. And I said, that's great. Then we know where to start because we can't jump. We have to say, hey, if that is required to start from the fifth grade and we go to, to end school in one year's time, let's do a lot of math. Let's change the schedule for these students. Let's repair to get them into the system again and asking us what is required. And then we see what is the reparative measure. And, and, and what I say here, teachers teach. Oh, this is like a Trump slogan. <laughs> oh. And <laughs> principals need to organize. And that's another profession. Because some principal, they haven't, they haven't taught in the classroom for 20 years. So them to be the expert in teaching. No, teachers are experts. And principals need to be very, very highly skilled in how to organize their schools. And they need to have a very good communication because the principal needs to talk a lot about teachers and asking the question, what is required for the student? And trying to, to prioritize between all the things that we need to do in the schedule. And that requires flexibility. So let's go on. And also what is important when you look at that, when you get the results already in September, I think the greatest with that is that you can follow the progress. To measure the progression, in student results is much more important than every June measuring what happened, you know, with, with, with a group of students, because then they are not even messing, measuring the same a group of students, because a lot of things can happen. So here we see the schools together in this municipality, they, when we asked the teacher in September, they said that, hey, 70% will be able to continue on to, to a gymnasium. So, and we measure every December, April, uh, and we have a lot of conversations, and they reach a number of 86.2. So when we put pressure on um, repairing uh, and actually talking about what is your challenge, because it looks very different. And this is, if we just take the statistics and, and look at how many have different sorts of grades, we can actually make a very simple uh, prognostic cluster, where we actually can say, if you enter into a classroom here in Dala school, 60% are very high achievers. And I know now, because the principal is sitting up there, that you have one specially gifted student too. I don't know if it was this class. But hey, you need to know these things because you need to prepare for it. Because in, in, in this school here, uh, 2%. So we actually get the quite number. And here we see the Fs. You see that in one classroom here, we have 23 of them, and they have uh, uh, a high number of newly arrived students, because it's where they get a place to live. So they tend to be there. And these things we need to know, because being a principal there, or there, or there, or there, is very different. So we need to be good at knowing our challenges. So then we see here, we can actually create a small, you know, this is just a symbol, that actually stole from school Baker. So, <laughs> but I put my own names to it. <laughs> it is really and, and, and so, and, and this one, I brought this one to the, to the principals group, and we talk about some principals need to be flipping results. They really have to say, hey, what we have done so far has not produced the results. Let's do something new. Let's try something completely different, putting a lot of... Uh, and, and producing new processes of learning. Some principles need to be good at growth. Some things work, some things don't. Let's stop doing the one who doesn't work and try to, to spread what, what is working. And that's quite a tricky skill. And some principles, they need to refine their results because a well-producing organization sometimes can 
can stagnate in, in, their, um, in their development. So they need to train processes, especially if the, the, the organization gets very stiff. Sometimes new things happen, so you don't want to be that, what can we do through? You, know, you want to say what is required for us to succeed with this challenge. And uh, so one thing I, I think is that we, we need to really be, when it comes to management of schools, we, we, we have a theory and we talk about it, but how to do it practically is very, very tricky. Uh, and, and, and talking about the compensatory mandate in practice is very, very tricky. So if I, if I look at statistics, SCB is a huge organization that collects all the statistics. They came up with, with facts that actually says, uh, to give all the students when they start school and, and some sort of a number who says the likelihood of them succeeding in schools. So par parental education is the most important thing. Immigration, and it's especially the, the, the years that the kids have been here in Sweden, and sometimes not as much of a belief in, in par parental immigration. So uh, parents' income is very important. We don't believe it, but hey. And uh, the sex of the students, we know that boys, they don't have the same uh, capacity of fixing school today as it is organized today. Financial aid is something that's over a wholesale time. Number of siblings, imagine, they actually say that. And I got very curious, you know, and they, I asked, but what, you know, explain this to me. And they say that having no sibling, not good. Having one, good. More than one, not so good. <laughs> so, if it's Saturday today, and if you're go planning to go home now and have planning for your future, remember, I have two kids. <laughs> so, I I'm very well planned. Uh, and what is important too, school socioeconomic status is important for the outcome of the students. Knowing and also, if you live in an area, so sometimes when I worked in Ronna, uh, I said these kids go with an identity of living in a shitty area and they go to a shitty school. And that's not the way, you know, when you present yourself searching for a job, hey, that's my background, and be, you know, believing in themselves. So, so that's, and, and to compensate for this should be in focus. That's challenge number one. And principles and teachers should be experts in organizing this in a very practical manner. And that's when it comes to do, having homeworks. In certain schools, just few students do their homeworks, but we still continue giving homeworks. <coughs> and then we say, oh, bad. As if students don't want to achieve. And some, I, I, at my school, they, they say to all the parents that you should read with your kids every day. <laughs> And hey, I'm in the system. I don't read with my kids. Sometimes I'm too tired, so I sing with them, you know. And so <coughs> I want to, and I know that I should talk about certain things, but sometimes we, we, we want to, we should, we, sh we know that we should, but we can't do it. And especially, imagine, it's not uncommon that there are single moms with three kids who are raised in another system where they speak another language, having, you know, and then coming home with your kids, helping your kids with, with homework, where you don't understand what you're asking. I think even, you know, as an ex-principal, I don't understand every, always what to know and not to know. So it's complicated. So we need to be able to compensate for that. How do you build in that in the classroom? Repetition, and, and how do you plan the whole thing, and how do you present what to know and what to know? And, and another thing about boys, I went to the, to the school of Elkets, you know, the, the, the board of education, and I actually looked up here, and this is what they say about boys. This is from Google Translation. You know? <laughs> oh, it's lovely. Uh, so they have, they have huge problems in thinking with consequence, <coughs> that the concentrational skills are less. Hey, boys are boys, and they underproduce. And how do we organize the school for boys? No, we say this is the standard, we do it right, but we actually don't consider how do you practically do this. And the governmental of official investigation did a report on men and equality, and I was very proud to be named there many times. 
and what not, to, you know, about something personal, but what we did in Roma Skolan, because we raised the results, especially with the boys, because we learned, we said, what is the parent doing at home, always asking, how is it going, did you do the homework? And we said, if we can build in that in the system, we can help the boys, because they don't have that reflection. But the law says that we should have once the semester, the teacher to sit down with the parent and the student to say, what do you want to improve this semester? Hey, it doesn't work for some boys. So we need to really do this on a practical level. And uh, who are the students who doesn't pass? Yeah, how many years have they been in the system? And do we have the whole picture of them? When we said the challenge number two, we said if we can break this one, if we can actually be good at these eight groups. This is what I, when I had a good conversation with my principals and I asked them, what is your biggest uh, challenge? And they were actually the, the students who are early showing that they are after. Uh, some students who actually have intellectual problems, but we don't put them into what we call särskolan. But they have a problem, but we don't know how to do it practically. And, and you, you can see here, there are many students who change schools a lot. And people who stay at home too much. Are, so if we can make a plan and be really good at these students, Honey, you come in with the best one in Sweden. Watch me. <laughs> um, so so if we, this is the big challenge. Because we, we can... And another thing here, with, with teachers, and this is when we come for... Sometimes I think in the system, we... We tend to pretend that things that we don't want to see, that it isn't there. Like teachers who aren't qualified to be teachers. Some of them are very good. But it is like when I go and look for the, the, uh, the curriculum, I want to find the curriculum for dummies so I can understand it. Because I'm not a teacher, I'm afraid. And why don't we give support for the ones who are in the system? who actually is doing the job. Because I asked school Berkett once, why do we write uh, instructions that are made for qualified, very good teachers? And they say, yeah, that's the one, the group we want to see. But I say, hey, reality is here. They are not qualified, some of them. And some teachers are qualified. I said, for example, Sue and Mary, it sounds like from my previous book, uh, and so, some teachers are qualified, but some do excellence in the classroom, and some are struggling. We, we need to... The, the, uh, so, so what I'm actually saying here is that what can we do, or should we ask us the question, what would it take for everyone to succeed? So what I mean here is that how do we make a poorly educated teacher to succeed in the classroom, then every classroom in Sweden will be great. Wouldn't you agree? And how do we compensate for all the, the lack of parental education and stuff like that? We, if we can turn that one, we are actually succeeding. So things are there and we need to address them, not pretend that they, they, if we don't talk about them, they will disappear. No, they've always been unqualified teachers. So finally, uh, um, in the steering, and that's why I think the focus needs to be a little bit changed here. This is also from Google Translate. Uh, uh, and, and it's so important, the role I'm in now, when I try to lead principles and we try to create some sort of development that is very easy for me. I was once called the, the super rector. Oh, that's so embarrassing. Because it says that, as if I know better than the ones in place. So... When you lead the school by talking about what others should do, that's not the way to do it. Because politicians, I don't know what the principal should do. I can't tell anyone else to do. The only thing I can say is that everyone becomes someone in the context they are in. We can have poor students who become popes and presidents. Yeah, they can be. Nothing is actually saying that. So if they are in the right context, they will succeed. And that is for everyone in this change of management. So we have to ask, 
the, the, the teacher needs to ask the students, how do I create a good context for you? And principals need to, to ask the, the teachers, how can I make you succeed in your classroom? What is required? Not what can I do? Because then it's like, oh, you get a day off or, or you get to go to this course, you know, that we don't, it won't change anything. So we need to, instead of everyone, things coming from up, above and down, we need to actually say what is required. So I had to ask myself, how can I create a good context for uh, principles so they can succeed? And they can ask the same question down and so on. Uh, so everyone has to ask themselves, whose context do I create? So that's my thing. And thank you very much. And that's a book that I gave out last year. So a little bit of commercial there. <laughs>